All right, only uh, two quick announcements today. Number one, if there's any questions you guys have at any point about your registration or which group you're a part of, please make sure to visit the table right out here. We have our admin team who can get you registered if you're not yet signed up or they can answer any questions you have about how to access the materials or, or any of the questions that may, may be on your mind. Um, the second thing I want to let you know about is our giving. You'll notice that we don't pass around an offering basket anywhere. We haven't done that since 2020. Um, at this point, all of our giving has been moved online. Uh, so you can, you can give by you know, digital check, uh, credit card. All of it uh, is given free to you. Um, and we want this to be a blessing to you. But if it's something that you're just moved to, to give and just God moves in the generosity of, of making an offering to BSF, we would appreciate that. There's ways to sign up for recurring giving. Um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of financial needs for getting the headquarters to run and some of the materials that they produce. So we do thank you ahead of time on your generosity. So let's uh, begin with a time of prayer. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing yourself in yet another way, Lord. You are the righteous and holy and perfect and matchless God. You are infinite. How can we possibly describe you through the passage that we're covering today, Lord? So I realize that, that I am fully inadequate to explain all that is in here, Lord. I pray that you would testify in truth to exactly what this passage is talking about. Lord, speak to each one of us individually because you know each one of us that well, Lord. We pray this in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. All right, so let's go to our map. Start with Oklahoma City here. So first off, we are gonna begin in Jerusalem and we're gonna get to see some of uh, what Solomon ha has set up in Jerusalem. Then we'll go to Shechem. There's these two mountains, Ebal and Gerizim. We're going to be right there where, uh, where Rehoboam is crowned king. And then Tel Dan is this last spot. And that's where the uh, idol worship was set up, was in those mountains. There's a, the northern altar, as you guys read this week, and there's a southern altar in Bethel. So let's begin in 1953. So in 1953, there was a scientist, uh, researcher, he was called Dr. Alfred Kinsey, and he had released two famous publications. You may not have heard of him, but the publications were on human sexuality, and the report that he produced was called the Kinsey Report. It was such a big deal when it came out that Time Magazine, Life, McCall's, and Look Magazine all featured his story as covers, cover stories that week. In hindsight, many people would agree that Kinsey's report began the sexual revolution in 1953. The details of his report were very sobering. He said 85% of men had engaged in premarital sex. 50% of men had an unfaithful marriage. 71% of women had an affair that had not hurt their marriage. 69% of men had slept with prostitutes. 10% of men had been homosexual for at least three years. So according to this report, the sexual behaviors that had been taboo in America in 1953 were actually very common. You can imagine the shock of those who read it. Suddenly everybody started to wonder, is sexual sin much more common than I thought it was? Kinsey's conclusion was this, everyone is doing this stuff and anyone who represses their sexual feelings does so at the risk of their mental health. Do you find it hard to believe that America embraced his views? They were eager to adopt this because it was a license to do whatever felt right. The report ended up selling 200,000 copies, and unsurprisingly, Kinsey found a place among famous scientists like Darwin, Galileo, and Freud. He became the authority on sexual behavior in 1953. He even testified before Congress. He weighed in on court decisions. He launched sex education programs in schools. And he spoke in public forums about redefining marriage. But something strange happened decades later. The researchers looked at his data a little closer, and they realized that something didn't seem right with his report. 
It turned out he had passed off average Americans, as many had per- presumed in his study, for actually 1,400 convicted sex predators serving time in prison. So the numbers of his report were completely skewed towards sex predators instead of average people. By the time the scientific community had realized how flawed his research was, it was too late. The damage had been done in America. America had changed its standard for a healthy sex life based on his, his guidance. Kinsey had convinced millions of people that the behavior of criminals should be normal among healthy citizens. To date, there's been no reputable survey that has re- reproduced Kinsey's statistics, not even close. So many of us have our, the same question in our mind. Why on earth would you do such a thing? That seems so damaging. I mean, for somebody to promote a lie and make immorality seem normal, this is unacceptable. But when we look at the stacks of magazine covers with his face on it and the piles of cash for his speaking engagements and the research grants given to his graduate programs, we start to get an idea of what was really going on here. You see, Dr. Kinsey was craving success. He wanted approval. He wanted notoriety, he, and it, so much so that he elevated success over ethics. And today we have a world that is deeply confused about gender, sexuality, marriage, divorce, and abortion. And we can't help but wonder, where will we be today without Kinsey's dangerous and reckless ambition? One thing's for sure, success is a dangerous motivator. What would you do for success? We could criticize his ethical failure here all day long, but when we look in the mirror each day, we see someone looking back who also has a craving to succeed. Michael Jordan once said it this way. He said, some people want it to happen, some people wish it would happen, but others make it happen. You see, our culture everywhere has convinced us that success separates your average man from the extraordinary man. We are programmed from a young age to be able to fight and compete our way to success at all costs. Success makes us feel good. It encourages us. It entitles us. You might say it validates you. But let me ask you this question. What lengths would you go to to succeed? Would you take a little bribe if it meant securing a business deal? Would you tell a tiny little lie or hide an insignificant detail if it meant winning big? Would you twist the rules a bit, maybe, if you knew that it would guarantee your success? So many of us would have to admit that we are eager to achieve some form of success. At the end of our lives, we want to say, we did one thing really well. And if we're honest, maybe some of us would be willing to sacrifice personal integrity to get there. And when you look at the great men of history, you don't see their character or their standards on display. What you normally see is their achievement and their competitiveness. So what is it about success that captures our dreams and our focus? Perhaps it isn't about the trophies and the titles and the accolades that we fight for. Maybe there is actually something deeper at work when we want to succeed. Maybe the real desire behind success is the need to be recognized and to be loved. If people accepted you as somebody special or exceptional, then you'll finally feel like your life has meaning. But as we saw with Dr. Kinsey, he had to walk through a minefield of compromises and shortcuts in order to get the success that he wanted. If all goes well, you might become the next famous success story, or you might just lose everything trying to gain the world. Here's what Jesus said. He said, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Maybe God knows that your path to success doesn't need to cost your integrity. Maybe there's a better way. So let's look into the men of our passage today, because they all have one thing in common. They wanted success, and they were willing to do it by any means necessary. But in the end, they found themselves losing more than they bargained for, didn't they? So first, we're going to look at Solomon's unprecedented legacy of success. Did he ever find what he was looking for? And then second, we're going to look at Rehoboam. 
Will he trust God's idea of success enough to overcome his family's past with sin? And then lastly, Jeroboam has to choose either God's view of success or his own view that will separate him from God. Can Jeroboam do a a successful life without God? Which will he pick? So let's start off with Solomon, as I said. So the life of King Solomon, as I'm sure you've read, is epic on every level. I can't even imagine a king surrounded by more just splendor than he was. The Queen of Sheba said this quote about Solomon, which I think is maybe the most flattering quote I've found. So the, he, she said, uh, the report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true, but I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. And yet, if we were to look at this from the other side, what is God's report of Solomon's empire? I think it would have sounded pretty different. And actually, from Deuteronomy 17, we know that God sees this differently because he set some ground rules for the kings of Israel. Here's what he said. When you say, let us set a king over us, the king must not acquire a great number of horses for himself or make people return to Egypt to get more of them. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of the law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life. So that's kind of God's standard. Let's just go down the list there and see how Solomon measures up to the standard. Well, okay, so in, in 2 Chronicles 1, here's what it said. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, so total fail on that one. But, I mean, hopefully he, didn't, he at least didn't get the horses from Egypt, right? There's no way he did that. But the next verse says Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt. So fail there too. Okay, next one. The king has made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stones. So again, he failed on the, the gold and silver rule. And then in our passage this week, it begins in 1 Kings 11 by saying, King Solomon loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. So basically an F plus across the board. So, I mean, in summary, he he broke all the rules. But here's the kicker in the next verse. This one to me is the worst of all. It says, he followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David, his father, had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives, who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their God. So again, Solomon, he broke every rule. He broke the old rules. He broke the new rules. He broke the rules that weren't written down. He broke the common sense rules. He did it all. Scripture says he didn't follow the the Lord completely, is what it said, which I think is very generous, because he didn't even follow the Lord partially. But beside all these rules, I just imagine if we could, could bring Solomon on stage right now, he'd be pretty pleased with himself, wouldn't you think? I mean, he did succeed. He, he did it all. He won at life, you could say. He got all the things. He loved all the women. He piled up all the gold. He bought all the horses. No one can look down on him and say otherwise, right? It's almost like he won at Monopoly, but it was like real life Monopoly. He actually had a Monopoly on the world, it seemed like. But look at what Solomon says about his life in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Here's what he said. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well. The delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. But then here's the interesting part. Listen to this last sentence. Here's what he says. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything 
was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. And I don't think any of us expected that part. Consider all of your personal success today. Where has it all led you? What has it gained you at this point in your life? I think King Solomon, he serves really as a cautionary tale to us. He's a man who had piles of everything, and yet all he could say is that he was chasing after the wind. So according to Solomon, he he said that nothing was gained, right? But we can see that much was lost in the process. We know that the foreign wives led Solomon to stray from his Lord. We know that Solomon's children were raised on idolatry. We know the people of Israel were angry at him for the heavy workload and the taxes that he, that he decreed on them. And then this false God worship emptied the whole nation of holiness. This was supposed to be a holy place of God. But it introduced a demonic presence into Israel. When you look at these demonic idols that he brought the worship in, you realize the depth of what was going on here. So this is Kamosh, and he was a god from Moab. He was worshipped by performing human sacrifices. If you were an Israelite and you wanted to murder someone, one option would be to go make an offering to Kamosh. If you killed them on the altar of Kamosh, you could do it in the name of worship. The next one was Ashtoreth. She was a goddess from the northern region of Sidon. Besides being a goddess of fertility, many believe she was some kind of Mother Earth figure. Ancient traditions actually claim that she was the wife of God. So some people would worship Ashtoreth and say that it was part of God worship that got mixed in with all of their customs. And Ashtoreth worship took place on the high places. You'll see that phrase over and over again in Scripture. The high places were the hills and the mountains of Jerusalem. And they had trees that were carved into strange phallic objects. And they were shaped like idols. The poles were a centerpiece of idolatry rituals. And the rituals of of Ashtoreth would involve things like rape, prostitution, and orgies. Those who participated in the debauchery of this Ashtoreth worship, it was all done in the name of being blessed with fertility. If you had a problem with your farm, they would make excuses and go engage in this sort of thing to pray for a better harvest. But then here was the absolute worst one. It was this god, Molech, and he was derived from the Ammonites. It involved this half bull, half man figure who would be sitting in a throne The inside of his stomach was filled with a a blazing hot furnace. And when Molech was worshipped, the priest would place a live newborn child on his burning hands, and the baby would scream in horror. Some Molech statues had the arms hollowed out, and they would push the baby into the flames. They offered their child to Molech to have good fortune. But maybe it was just a front for getting rid of unwanted children which our society knows, unfortunately. All of these things entered Israel under the authority of Solomon's reign. So in the midst of Solomon amassing this monument of success in his life, he sowed seeds of of the personal glory, but he plowed over everything that was holy to God, and he reaped a harvest of total lawlessness in Israel. Before he was done reigning, Solomon had allowed murder, sexual perversion, and abortion to be legalized and ritually practiced in his kingdom. It served to appease his wives and boost his approval rating as king. People loved the freedom that Solomon gave them to sin whenever they wanted. What are you willing to do to win the approval of the people around you? Where will approval end up leading you? Can you say that anyone's approval is more important to you than God's? So if if only Solomon had considered the riches of God, he would have known what he was really missing. As luxurious as Solomon's palace was, it was a dirty old shoebox compared to the riches of God's throne room in heaven. God is unimpressed by our worldly success. Instead, he wants our heart to be devoted to him fully. And Solomon missed out on that success. 
In the final days of Solomon's reign, God said this about him. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord. It didn't matter what he had amassed in life. God only looked at the heart. That which can be built on the foundation of sin can be toppled very easily. And we see in, in uh, 1 Kings eleven fourteen, 14, the Lord raised up against Solomon an adversary. So that's my first principle. Only a legacy built on God will stand forever. So Solomon built this legacy of sin and disobedience and exploitation. He was proclaimed to be the wisest man of his day. But ironically, Jesus' parable about a wise and a fool man describes Solomon perfectly. Here's what Matthew 7, 24 says. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on sand. I think it describes Solomon perfectly. The wisest man actually became a fool. He ignored the word of God. He built his empire on the shaky ground of sin. And his adversaries, men like Rezin and Hadad and Jeroboam, provided the, the gale force wind and the rain that would knock over his empire when it was time. So I think here's where ambition becomes very tragic to us. We are free to choose our sins on the way to the top, but the consequences of our sins are imposed on us unwillingly. Even the most powerful guy around, Solomon, could not hide from his consequences. I believe that God has infinite mercy for a man like Solomon, but I believe he also has a deadline for sin. We can't study Solomon's downfall and his battles with sin without taking a moment to look at our own sin. How long is God going to let your sin continue? His death is recorded in 1 Kings 11 because sin had run its course in his life. God gave him chance after chance to repent, and he never did. And in all of Solomon's splendor, he was returned to the dirt when he died. There's a, a verse in Romans that says, the wages of sin is death. And we can see here that Solomon's payment was due. God offers us a legacy to build on that is very different than Solomon's. We can know that our legacy is built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Daniel chapter 2 tells us how this legacy plays out. It says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it itself will endure forever. The legacy of God will last forever. You can build your lives on a legacy that lasts forever. And God invites us to share in the glory of what he is building. Romans 8, which I quote probably monthly, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the glory reserved for you and I. This is the glory that we don't have to sell our soul to receive. So what legacy are you building your life on today? And how long is it going to stand? So as we turn to the next chapter in 1 Kings 12, the torch is officially being passed to Solomon's son, who is Rehoboam. He's inherited the throne from his father, but he's also inherited a lot of sinful behaviors and traditions. He's, all, he's inherited an obsession with becoming a complete success in his life and carrying on his family name. In verse 1, we read that Rehoboam went to Shechem, as I showed you in the map, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. As you noticed maybe in the map, it is pretty far north from Jerusalem. And I think it may be a hint that Rehoboam was going up north to appease his critics in that moment. He didn't want to have the, the coronation down south with them not involved. He wanted to get them on the same page. So Jeroboam shows up at the ceremony, and he wastes no time in shaking things up. And he starts by questioning the working conditions, as we saw. 
In verse 4, Jeroboam accuses him, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Jeroboam was not just challenging Rehoboam's authority, he was also undermining his power. He said, if you'll ease up, then we'll serve you. And I can imagine Rehoboam in that moment, a man who wants to succeed, a man in a position of power, he wants to prove that he is strong. He wants to prove that he's a man of success. He knows that this interaction could define his legacy or his perception as a leader. So how can Rehoboam become a successful leader if some troublemaker is going to push him around like this? He's got to show some muscle. How's he going to fill his father's shoes as king if he shortens the workday? How's he going to gain more wealth and build up a successful empire if he can't use cheap labor? Under the surface, Rehoboam knows that his father built an empire on the backs of his people, and it wasn't sustainable. Frankly, without God's blessing like it was over Solomon, Rehoboam has no chance of success right now. This is near impossible. So these expectations are huge. The people want rest, and the kingdom needs to build. Honestly, there is only one king that I know of that can do this. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus also said, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you. We see two quotes from Jesus. I will give you rest, and I have a kingdom to offer you. Only Jesus can make that kind of a claim. And anyone who tries to stand in the shoes of Jesus and do God's work will find endless frustration at gaining success. The jobs that are for God to do are for us to follow. In his doomed circumstance of trying to achieve the impossible victory, Rehoboam decides to walk down his father's broken path to success. And like his father, he he looks for strategy more than he looks for compassion. So when his younger, less experienced advisors tell him that he should just drop the hammer on these workers and get them back to work, of course Rehoboam does it because that's what he had in mind in the first place. In verse 14, Rehoboam lets him have it. He says, my father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips and I will scourge you with scorpions. So the scorpions that he's talking about are small metal barbs that you would attach to the end of the whip. And when people would whip someone, it would open your flesh as it hit you. You can imagine their response to what he said was less than enthusiastic. They don't care about his father's methods. They don't care about his lineage. They owe him nothing. And Rehoboam learns that domination is not leadership. The whole exchange drives a deep wedge between the north and the south, and we see them split in half, and Rehoboam barely escapes with his life. The ten tribes go to the north, and two tribes go to the south, and so the the north maintains the name Israel since it has more of the population. And just like that, the unity that Rehoboam's grandfather had won through blood and sweat and tears gets torn into pieces after just a single generation of Solomon's leadership. So King Rehoboam, he now has a job of saving face. He's got to try to salvage the identity of that southern empire any way he can. And in verse 21 of 1 Kings 14, we're reminded that a nation's identity comes from a king's identity. The verse says that Rehoboam's mother's name was Naamah. She was an Ammonite. That's that's code language for she was a pagan idol worshiper. She worshiped idols just like Asherah. And what we see in verse 22 is that idolatry spreads like wildfire in a moment like this. The passage says, Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. By the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealous anger more than those who were before them had done. They also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones and Asherah poles on every hill and under every spreading tree. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. The people engaged in detestable practices of all the nations that the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. So the first 
of the Ten Commandments gives us a little bit of an insight into a thing that we call generational sin. God said, if you make yourself an image in the form of anything, you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who keep my commandments. So where have you noticed generational sin in your own past? Perhaps it's something that has already been passed down to your children. Perhaps your parents struggled with alcohol abuse or verbal abuse or bad habits. And all of those items in your life, maybe they bear a burden on you. Perhaps Rehoboam experienced that same thing. We can see the cursed legacy of his parents, the foreign wives that redefined success for him. Do you know what Rehoboam needs with a broken family history like that? And maybe something that you need as well. You need to be born again into another family, the family of faith. You see, the family of God has no generational sin associated. The family of God has no curse. In God, we are free from sin. When we repent and ask for forgiveness, all is forgiven for the children of God. There is no generational sin in the family of God. And just as God had raised up opposition against Solomon, now Rehoboam gets a knock on the front door, and it is not the UPS man. So just after five years after Rehoboam's reign, King Shishak of Egypt plunders the great legacy of Rehoboam's father and grandfather that's all sitting inside that temple space. God has a way of placing judgment on our lives that speaks exactly to the sins that we struggle with. Maybe you've noticed that in your life, a sin that you struggle with, and God speaks specifically to it. So what was stolen in the temple there basically amounts to um, Rehoboam's family heirlooms. The temple had no spiritual value to him whatsoever, but of all the things to take, the Bible mentions specifically one thing that was taken. It was the golden shields. Here's what the golden shields were. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. So between the lines in this illustration, I think God is telling us something here. Rehoboam was using his father's legacy as his shield. But the only shield that can really protect a man is the shield of God. Here's what 2 Samuel 22 says about the shield of God. It says, my God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. What shield do you rely on today? Who shields your walk with God? So here's my second principle. A successful walk with God demands repentance for sin. We see the past of sin clearly in Rehoboam's life. He inherited his father's power-hungry leadership style. He lived with his mother's idolatry and grew up to rely on it. And his family treasure was worshipped over the riches of God. Generational sin did a number on Rehoboam. And as a result, he was set up for failure on day one. But you and I can take heart. We are not judged based on the sins of our parents. We're not judged based on our siblings or our friends or our neighbors. We are judged on our personal account with God. It's easy to see that repentance was available to Rehoboam every step of the way. It was the one thing that could have turned his life around. You know what repentance is? It means turning away from what is wrong and beginning to follow God's path for our life, which is a path away from sin. So where is repentance needed in your life? I look at Rehoboam's life, and the thing that makes repentance urgent to me is the fact that there is no great victory with Rehoboam continuing down this path. It just leads deeper and deeper into defeat and into sin, into consequence. But repentance allows us to admit what was wrong, and it asks God to set us back on track. 
Your past and your surroundings don't need to define your walk with God. Those are just other people's business. You, your walk with God is personal to you. At any moment, you can repent and follow him and ask him for healing. So I'm going to go kind of quickly through the life of Jeroboam. But in verse 26, Jeroboam realizes an urgency for success. Again, we see this theme. It's a do or die situation for him. He realizes that if everyone goes yearly to go to Jerusalem to worship, his empire will fall apart. He said, they will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. So after seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. And he said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I think he was threatened by God. And truly, every sinful thought that we have in our minds should be threatened by God. We should fear God in our sin. Any motive that is contrary to God is a sin. And any friend of sin is an enemy of God. In what area of your life do you fear God as a threat to your motives? So by pushing aside pushing God aside and drawing sinners away from God, Jeroboam succeeded in separating out Israel. And Israel had one hope, and it was God, and yet he drove a wedge between them. Of course, God in his mercy, he sends a prophet to help Jeroboam. We see this altar split apart. We see the ashes pouring out. But Jeroboam was not going to let a no-name prophet push him around. The man of God prevails, and the altar was split, and he got to see the whole thing. It was an awesome display of God's power over sin. He can crush the ugliness of your sin at any moment. I've heard of stories of addiction. People went to God and just asked him for power over their sin, and instantly, God dropped the power of addiction from their lives through a time of prayer and supplication. So if you are struggling under the power of sin, I ask that you to go to God Ask him for power, because we can see here God has power over sin. So even though he saw this moment, he went too far there. Even though he saw this moment, Jeroboam's heart was not changed. A heart that is set on power is powerless to sin. It says, even after this, Jeroboam did not change his evil ways, but once more appointed high priests for the high places from all sorts of people. Anyone who wanted to become a priest, he consecrated for the high places. This was the sin of the house of Jeroboam that led to its downfall and its destruction. By removing all these restrictions, he made false idol worship even more common. And he created more and more distance between people and their God. What impact is your drive to succeed having on those around you? Are you ultimately leading people to God, or are you keeping people for yourself away from God? Let's look at our last principle here. Sin separates us from the success that God has in mind. Isaiah 59 has a beautiful verse in it. It says, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear For your hands are stained with blood and your fingers with guilt. So I've said a lot here about how not to achieve godly success. But what I have said precious little about is how to find godly success. So let me finish with a word on that. It can be said briefly, but it could take a lifetime to make part of who you are. Our success is found in the fact that we are loved by a God who loves us. God has at his fingertips the riches of heaven, and every treasure that can be imagined is God's possession. But there's one thing that he wants that God doesn't have right now, and that is your heart. You are God's inheritance in heaven. God cares about you deeply. He loves you. And Deuteronomy 3 says, for the Lord's portion is his people. It's you. The surpassing the riches of heaven is you. You are a success in the eyes of God because you are a precious inheritance to him. 
So as we seek success in our lives, we need to always be mindful of the fact that God has seen us as a success already because as we follow him, as our heart is drawn to him, that is the riches that he wants for us. That's the success that God has in mind for your life. So let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for the way that you have involved yourself in our lives the way that you have reached to us and cared for us. Your compassion and your mercy is inspirational to us, Lord. It doesn't even seem fair, honestly, that we would be your inheritance, Lord. You've given us everything. So, Lord, I pray that that inheritance would be secure in every man. I pray that you would just uh, help us to realize the gravity of our sin and just to desire to come to you as an inheritance that is beautiful, Lord. Help us to follow you and to trust you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everyone.